Hey guys, subscribe for daily content. And if you're shopping for gear, make sure you check out the description for the newest items at some of the very best online retailers. There's also links for some of the items that I personally recommend. Thanks. What's going on YouTube? Metal Complex here and today, oh boy, today <laughs> I've got a really awesome knife review slash knife overview to share with you guys. This is the Hoghouse Veli, which uh, apparently is a finish for brother. I think. Um, so these are uh, custom made in Finland. Um, every year at the end of the year, um, I do a little uh, like a, you know, the best knives of 2023. And there are different categories. It's kind of like an award show, right? I think a lot of channels do this. I, I mean, I got my idea from Nick Shabazz, but I, you know, there, there are a lot of knife channels who do their best picks for one reason or another. I handle a lot of knives. If this is your first venture into my channel, I do two uploads a day uh, consistently. I do not come off of that mark. In fact, I've been doing it consistently for almost four years now. The channel's older than that, but I've been doing it uh, consistently for over four years. That's 730 uploads a year. Now, not every upload contains a brand new, you know, individual knife. Sometimes, you know, that's I do an unboxing and a review, right? It's safe to say that I handle a lot of stuff year in and year out. I handle stuff on the budget end, the mid-range, the high end, the ultra high end, right? Your premium, ultra custom, blah, blah, blah. Uh, most of the knives that I handle range from about 20 bucks to about $5,000. I've got a pretty good idea of what to expect uh, in different price ranges. Uh, I'm going to say this right at the beginning uh, of the upload. This is absolutely one of my favorite knives of 2023, and it is also one of the nicest knives that I have ever handled dollar for dollar. This is an expensive knife, right? If you, uh, if you don't like the idea of pocket knives being over a uh, hundred dollars or two hundred dollars, I'm gonna tell you right now, you're probably not gonna want to watch this. But if you're somebody who has been around for a while and you know, you know, the ins and outs of the knife world and you know why knives get more expensive, right, by tier, um, then stick around because this this one's really gonna blow your mind. This, this really is one. Of, I mean, this is this is one of my favorite knives ever. It's definitely definitely going to be a part of the an end of the year, uh, you know, sort of 2023 best knives on the Metal Complex YouTube channel. Um, I had no idea. Uh, I remember hearing about Hoghouse knives and seeing the first model and thinking, yeah, yeah maybe at some point. And uh, Tools for Gents contacted me and said, hey, you want to check out the Veli? They showed me, and I was like, wow, that looks pretty nice. <laughs> then I handled it, right? Which is just another, it's one of those things where you look at something and you think, yeah, okay, I've seen stuff like that before. And then it, then it comes in and you handle it. You get it in your hands and you go, oh, no. No, I had no idea. This is very, very different. This is one of those times. This blew me away. I've spent some time with it. I'm ready to give you guys my thoughts. I very much doubt that you'll be able to just go and pick one of these up, but I will link the Hoghouse Knives website. I'll also link Tools for Gents so you can check there. Thanks so much to Tools for Gents for sending this in for me to take a look at. Thanks to my patrons for supporting me, and please make sure to follow me on Instagram at metal underscore complex. These things sell out quickly, and they will with or without my help talking about them on this channel. Um, they, they're, they're, oh boy. We'll get into it. Overall length of the valley, this is a larger one which I like, about 8.75 inches. Blade length, if you want to go to this corner of the frame, I just realized I, I probably spit on that beautiful blade. I'll have to wipe that off. 3.75 inches. You want to come all the way down here to the back of the frame. You could say 4 inches. In any case, the cutting edge is also 3.75 inches. Let me just I'm gonna wipe this off real quick. We're going to take a look at that blade. We're going to get some close-ups, and I, I don't need to... I don't need spit droplets on it while I'm doing that. Let's do uh, size comparisons up against the Ontario Rat Model 1 and the Ontario Rat Model 2. So, yeah, it's a big boy, definitely. Larger uh, than the Rat 1. Let's go ahead and do um, up against the Demco AD 20.5. There we go. How about the Spyderco PM2 and the Spyderco Para 3? And there we go. Uh, last but not least, how about the Benchmade Griptilian, or in this case, the Ritter Hogue, and the Benchmade Bug Out. Where is it? Why has the bug... There it is. It's just being stupid. Okay. How's the action? 
<laughs> so uh, first off, I want to point out that this is a knife that is a larger knife. But if you um, decided to carry it, it would really feel no different than carrying something like the Ritter Hogue. The, the way that it's shaped and the way that it sits in your pocket, right, just how much the thing, how much space this thing takes up in the physical universe, it doesn't feel like a knife. That Like when you say 8.75 inches, right, and a 3.75 inch blade, you're thinking that's pretty, right? I mean, not to the, you know, the guys who like have to tell everybody that they're carrying a, for, a Cold Steel Formax. We get it, right? Then you, you're, you're actually carrying a gigantic knife and everybody else doesn't know what they're talking about. Great. Congratulations. But to, you know, the average person who's just carrying like an eight inch knife, you know, or seven and a half inch knife with a three to three and a half inch blade, this might sound on paper like it's a bigger thing than it is. And then you get it and you're like, it is big, but it also doesn't feel very big. I think it's because it's balanced well and because when it folds up, it's a lot more compact than you might expect. Let's talk about the action. First of all, uh, this is just beautiful. Um, we have a perfect cutout for access to the lock bar. And also, um, the position of the detent ball when the um, flipper tab actually makes it to your finger, it's just exactly right. It's, it's, it's exactly right. We have a very controlled action that is perfectly consistent. Every area of that blade face is that it feels exactly the same. This will slowly turn into a perfectly fall shut knife. It is beautifully smooth. And the breakaway off the flip is so crisp and distinct. These are the types of things that really the feel without looking at it, just feeling it that feel substantially different because there's going to be, there's no shortage of people who will say, this is titanium and RWL 34 and it can't possibly be worth, they just, there's no way for their brain to, to comprehend that there are elements outside of the base materials that culminate into the final price tag. It, they're just not, it's, it's not possible for them, right? Every, all of us were there at one point and eventually you handle something and it's like your brain, the, the light switch goes off in your head and you go, Oh, Oh crap. Those guys, they weren't kidding. All those people kept telling me there's a reason for knives to get more expensive. Oh, I find, I get it. Right. But it's not like you have to go back and be like, say, I was wrong, guys. You don't have to do that, right? It's the internet. You can just slink away into the darkness with your realization. Um, this knife will do that to you. You handle it. You pick it up and you go, oh, maybe there are things outside of just the materials. Maybe quality does get better right, outside of what we knives is doing for, you know, with titanium and M390 for $250. Maybe it actually does get better than that. Yeah, it does. It gets way better. And knives like this will bring it to your attention with the force of a thousand trains slamming into your face at 200 miles an hour. It's in, it's ridiculous. The quality of this action, this breakaway, the overall feel of everything is so off the charts. We are definitely, what tier are we in? Koenig, Brown, uh, Herman, Shirogorov, right? Um, this that that's the territory. Halt. We're we're in this territory. This is what we're comparing with. We're not actually comparing with Wee knives or you know best deck knives or whatever, right? We're not we're not comparing with Hinder knives. We're not comparing with Chris Reeve knives, right? Demco. Stri we're not. No, we are a tier up. Um, absolutely. This is. <laughs> if if Shirogorov is the top end of this comparison parameter, we are comparing with Shirogorov knives 100%. So let's just, I just want to make that very clear. You can also, by the way, use this little hole right here to, oh man, that sound. <laughs> that sound. You can use that to um, reverse flick the blade. Um, yeah, the flipper tab is essentially perfect. It's It's a perfectly shaped flipper tab and the breakaway and release is perfect. The sound is perfect. All of the energy is transferring from my index finger to the blade, breaking that detent and absolutely slapping that blade out into the open position. It feels good. It looks good. It sounds good. You get all of the, uh, all the little serotonin and dopamine. You get all that, everything that goes into that with a flip, all actuating at once. Very good. The action's very good. <laughs> TLDR. Um, okay, let's do uh, 
thickness up against the Spyderco Pair 3. Really not all that thick of a knife, which is also part of the reason why it's a little easier to get it into the pocket. A knife this size is really about the same. Length and height up against the PM2 and Para 3. This guy's going to feel a lot more like the Para 3 in your pocket. It's just maybe a hair. Eh, it's more than a. Yeah, it's maybe a quarter inch longer closed up. Right. Maximum height. With the flipper tab, it does approach, but the PM2 is still a bit taller. Um, in and out of the pocket, this guy's a little heavier than my titanium PM2. It'll obviously be heavier than a G10 PM2, but I can't really say that it feels that much different. Let's go ahead and weigh it, because we are looking at titanium here, and we are. Let me take a look at the inside. Yeah, we do have a little bit of weight reduction. It's all the way at the back, so I guess let's look at it from back here. You can see right there. I'm not sure why they wouldn't do a little bit more. It is on both sides. It's interesting that they wouldn't come through and do... This is number 41, by the way. These are numbered. These are small bats, right? So don't go to their website and get all angry like, why don't you have hundreds of these things in stock for me to just purchase right now? Because they're small batch. That's another reason that they cost so much money. They can't just pump out a billion of these things just because, like, if you're mad, right? It's not like just because you're suddenly aware that it exists doesn't mean that they should have thousands of these things on the shelves ready to go. It's not how it works, right? These things take a while to make. There's a lot involved. And as far as I understand, they're a two-man operation in Finland. So we've got to keep our expectations realistic here. Um, people are like, you always go to bat for these guys. Absolutely, I go to bat for them. They take so much crap. Be companies like this take so much crap from people on the internet who have no idea. Yes, there should be people going to bat for some of these companies, right? 5.19 ounces. I honestly expected it to weigh a little bit more. Um, I don't think that's bad at all. Obviously, it's not going to have a perfect balance. If they decided to do like a carbon fiber version of this or something like that, then it would weigh a little bit less. But your balance as it is, is right a little bit back from like where you're going to put your index finger quite a ways back from the pivot, right? Balanced right here would have been about perfect, but it's not that far off. And honestly, the rest of the night feels so good that my brain is way too preoccupied to be concerned with the balance of it. But realistically, it is going to be a little bit large and a little bit heavy for some people. If you are used to carrying larger knives, um, if you're used to carrying the PM2 or the RAT or things that are heavier, like the Hinderer XM18 3.5 inch, this isn't going to bother you. I, it really isn't. I don't think that weight is, is really all that much. Let's go ahead and do a hardware check. I'll get out my tools. As per usual, my tools are very inexpensive and very recommendable. You can find them right down in the section of my description that talks about the tools I use on this channel. Um, these are useless, though, because we have, we got, we got, we're going to have that one guy, that's proprietary. Hardware. It's not proprietary. It's just a really nice looking flathead, um, you know, pivot. And you can take a small flathead um, and adjust these screws if you want to. Um, I think this is about the nicest looking flathead hardware that I've ever seen. Uh, it really looks good, and I don't think it takes away from the design or cheapens it up at all. It's also very minimal. I mean, you will be able to find the tools required, even if you don't like have your own set. You'll be able to find the tools required to take this thing apart, uh, I would say, within 25 feet of your current location, wherever you are, within 25 feet, there's probably the right tools to take this apart. So that's fine. We have two screws on each side, and we have a pivot, and that's it. There's nothing complicated going on here. I think that's really just nice. Um, so, yeah, no issues there. God, that I'm telling you, that detent. Hoghouse knives, I don't know if you're watching this. I don't know if you, you know, I don't know what you guys are doing here, but this. <laughs> oh, man, I've handled a lot of detents. I have experienced a lot of detents, right? Man, that's good. That just is just all the right chemicals, all the right tinglys going to the right places. Man, <laughs> this is done by people who know what they're doing. Not just, you know, like somebody who understands the machines, but also somebody who's clearly a um, uh, a knife nut. Like this, that's, that's only the type of thing that comes out in stuff like this when the person who's making it is an absolute knife-aholic and is so obsessed with every last little detail it has to be perfect there's the that's the only way you end up with a detent like this 
<laughs> it's one of those things where no matter how many times I show it on camera, it's just not going to do it justice. You, you have to feel it. And I know that there are some people watching right now who have these and will echo it, right? It's not an illusion, right, that's created by, you know, the, the pain of losing the amount of money it costs to buy this thing. No. I think that's speculation based on not knowing. But people who have actually picked this thing up, you know, if you've handled a lot of other stuff, they're, they're going to echo it. They're going to say the same thing. Um, it's just, it really is that good. Let's go ahead and measure blade stock thickness here real quick. Um, uh, blade stock thickness coming in at, trying to be careful here. Um, 136,000, 135,000 is about middle of the road for the knife roll. Not too thick, not too thin. I think that's fine. Let's go ahead and move into the meat and potatoes here. My God, is this a good looking knife? Um, and for people saying, I wish that that was not a Tanto, I am almost certain that they make a version of this that is not a Tanto. I'm pretty sure they have a drop point version. Um, this is beautiful. We have um, texturing and then we have micro texturing in between. You can actually see what I'm talking about there. There's little ribs in between the lines. That's really, really beautiful. But it's not just the texturing. That's not what I'm getting at. It's the extra, like this step right here, and then we we transition. It's a soft transition into vertical lines or lines that flow with the this, the curvature of this line, right? The edges are chamfered in areas that would otherwise be sharp. There's extra attention paid to these areas, these transitional areas that are usually in other designs very sharp because they're they're areas that are not paid attention to enough, right? This all of this is so beautiful. I love that we change the. <laughs> I love that they change the texturing when we get to a different angle, right? We have the vertical lines. We got the diagonal lines here. It's so nice. I also love the subtle way that they do their logo on the pivot. That is so classy. It looks so good. Instead of putting hog house on the, you know, the flat, which so many companies make that mistake. They really want their freaking banner on this thing screaming at you when it's so sad because what's lost is the beauty in the aesthetic of the thing that they created. Hoghouse Knives was like, nah, we want to show you the knife, right? The logo is there and it's subtle, but we want to show you the knife and show us the knife they did. They showed us. They even put the name of it on the thing, which honestly, I feel like maybe they shouldn't, but it, it's so subtle that I, I really don't even care, right? Um, this blade is RWL34. How do I know that? Because it says right here um, on the card that it comes with. And uh, RWL34 is going to perform almost exactly the same as uh, your CPM 154. And many of you know that that's one of my favorite steels of all time. So that's fine with me. People are going to have different expectations, right? A lot of times you get hung up on materials or you are still in that phase where blade steel equals value. Like uh, in this, I mean, obviously you don't want ATR 13 MOV up on this uh, knife, right? But when we're talking about steels, like this, super high quality steels. There's a reason that knife makers continue to work with RWL34. There's a reason for that. It's not just like, well, whatever, whoops, well, I tripped over this brick and it ended up being made of RWL34. I guess I'll make a knife out of it. No, there's a reason that you see that so often. It is a little bit friendlier to machine and polish, right? But it's also beautifully balanced. If you're going to use it, it's going to touch up easily. It's going to resharpen easily, reprofile easily, right? It's fairly tough. It's got decent edge retention. It's corrosion resistant. It's very, very balanced. It's a good composition to use on a knife like this. So collectors still like it, right? Knife enthusiasts in general like it. People who use knives, you, they like it, right? There's, there's a reason that this is a widely accepted steel. You can pick up uh, a knife in RWL34 30, uh, for substantially less money. You can also get a knife made out of CPM 20 CV for under $100, right? Or if not under 100, certainly under 150. Don't believe me, check out Amazon. So let's not do that. Let's not get hung up on the, why is it not M390? Why is it not? Don't get hung up on that because it's a waste of time. RWL34 is, I, I've got tons of knives, uh, knives in my collection that are RWL34. I love it, right? I think there's a wide variety of different steels that would be acceptable. And, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if they work with a wide variety of different steels. Um, but I just, I always find that a silly thing to get hung up on. This RWL34 does belong in the premium knife category. We're there, right? We're not looking at freaking Austin. 8 or 8 CR 13 MOV. Those are steels that obviously belong in the budget territory. We're looking at budget territory. We're, we're obviously looking at a premium blade steel here. Um, but let's get, let's get out of there 
What I want to talk about is this absolutely beautiful blade, which has a, a, some, some fingerprints on it because I was touching it. We have a uh, hand rub satin finish, and I mean, this is like extra. We got we got a little extra attention on that blade, that flat there. But then right here, we can see kind of, you know, Grimsmo style uh, milling lines on the blade, which... <laughs> Oh, sometimes that's not done in a nice way, and sometimes it's done in a very nice way. And what we have here is an example. My, my camera's actually having, it's very fine. My camera's having trouble focusing on it. Oh boy, that is nice. Now you're getting a lot of detail, and some of you might actually have this cranked up to 4K, and it's going to look like it's so deep that, um, you know, while you're cutting it, it might get hung up there. I think it, it might slow the blade down a, a little more versus like something that's fully flat ground or, you know, doesn't have these textured lines in there. And if you drag your fin fingernail across the blade, y yes, you can feel it. But do I think that it's like going to, um, somehow solely the potential performance of this knife? No. Uh, they're, they're not that deep. Um, honestly, I, I really like it. I, I think that this looks very, very good. And look at that. Look how perfect the final cutting edge is, like the final cutting bevel. This is just so spectacular. I, I'm I'm so blown away by this. If you do get a fingerprint on it, it tends to push down because they're pretty shallow. It tends to push down in between the little ribs, and then it takes a little bit to get it back out, right? And it might be the same way with some of the things that you're cutting. Um, but... I would venture to guess, you know, a, a quick spray, you know, use some rim oil or you do use some, you know, whatever. And then you just take a cloth and wipe it off. I think it'll be just fine. Right. So I'm okay with it being there. It might bother some people more, but I think, uh, I think it's really spectacular. Um, the cutting edge is just, <laughs> God, it's so nice. Very bitey, very sticky. Uh, this is a professionally sharpened knife for sure. The edges around the inside of the hole, these are all nicely knocked down. The edges on the spine are also knocked down. Just beautiful. It has such a, it's, this is a perfect example of simplicity that has complexity in it when you look, when you choose to look closer, you see the complexity in it. But the initial aesthetic is nice and clean, traditional, mo like a, like a, well, traditional knife lines, but more of a modern aesthetic, right? Um, but the details are there if you choose to look. And I really, this is the type of thing anymore. Because I've gotten so picky and snobby and critical over time, as you do when you review knives all day, every day, when this is your full-time job. That's what I do. This is my full-time job. You become critical. You become overly critical. You become snobby, right? That's just what happens. This is the type of thing that, God, when it's stuff like this comes to my channel, I'm just like, ah, oh, yes, I can still feel. <laughs> I can still get excited about stuff. Man, yeah. Huge fan of this. Every line on this knife is so gorgeous. Oh, no. There's no lanyard hole. They could have put one back here, but they didn't. I don't really care. I really wish that they had found a way to um, set this up so that left-handed people could still enjoy carrying it. But it doesn't, uh, it doesn't appear that way. It looks like it's just a right-handed knife. So that's a bummer. I hope that they can find a way to do that or make left-handed versions of this knife. That would be great. Beautifully machined and, you know, also they did the pocket clip. It's not an afterthought. It's amazing how often the pocket clip ends up being an afterthought and ruins the design. Nope. They said, hey, let's put a pocket clip on here that matches the design. And then let's also give it texturing that's not exactly the same as the texturing underneath it. No, they did uh, vertical lines here on this guy. So it follows the lines back here on the chamfered edge uh, and up here, right? Uh, which is just really nice. It's there if you look, right? But if you're if you're far away, it just says you're like, oh, that's textured in some way, right? Um, really nice retention, good length. Probably could have been a little shorter, but I'm not going to come down up for that. Nice ramp underneath. Edges are knocked down in and out of the pocket. Very smooth, very good. Uh, the texturing is present enough that it will create traction for your hands while you're holding this. We didn't really talk about the ergonomics. They're really good. The edges are knocked down. There's plenty of space on this handle, right? Subtle swell right here and back here, so it really fills the hand. You can also choke up a bit. I would just use one knuckle because you're right there by the edge, right? Um, but yeah, the pocket clip does not create an ergonomic hotspot, and it's very easy in and out of the pocket. I love this area here, the transition to the lock bar, and then the lock bar has a step on it, and the lock bar has 
a tech string that's going diagonal and like these vertical or horizontal lines depending on how you have the knife turn. Um, and then they this line just goes, it's like, oh, there's a screw there and goes around it. <laughs> the lock bar insert screw. That's just really nice. This could have been, this whole area just could have been substantially less interesting. And they just, they still decided to give this area its own character, right? Um, it's just, it's just nice. It doubles as the over travel stop as you would expect. There's nothing crazy going on with the stop pin. It's just a traditional stop pin and there's some deep shouldering now. Um, no blade play at all. No blade play up, down, left or right. No lock stick. Gosh. Um, no, I'm getting, I'm using my shirt and no, no pivot lash. This is, everything is so unbelievably solid on this thing. Everything just feel like they, man, they cut no corners. I mean, they, you know, they had to cut corners to make it. And I don't know. I don't know if that joke's worth making. I think uh, Hoghouse Knives made essentially a perfect product here. And obviously not everybody in the whole world. You, listen, you can, you can like, I'm, I don't want this review to come off as like anybody who doesn't understand and appreciate expensive knives. is just an idiot. No, not at all. We all climb the ladder at our own pace, and some of us never make it to this point. In fact, the vast majority of people will never, ever buy a knife that is this expensive. How expensive is this knife? I believe these come in at about $850. Wow. But up against their general competition, again, <laughs> Holt, Koenig, uh, Brown, uh, uh, Shurgroff, Herman. Um, there's a bunch of other ones that we, we could talk about there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there, no, no, no part of me is like, oh, why is it so expensive? There's no part of my brain that has trouble understanding why this is priced the way that it is. Of course it, of course it costs that much. Um, this is spectacular. Uh, for people that are transitioning from, you know, a lot of, like your $500 territory, right? You're wanting to move out. Like you, you like the, you, you've got a feel for what real quality is in that territory, right? Maybe you like, you know, get your, your, maybe you got your hands on an 80 20 or you've, you, you bought an Umnum Zon or you, uh, you handled the, uh, a full titanium hinder XM18 three and a half inch, right? And you're like, I got this kind of figured out. I've handled some other stuff in the same general territory. I want to know what it's like to bump up another $300, right? Um, this will this will define that very quickly. It's not going to be a, an element of quality that you have to search for. You're not going to have to like rack your brain. You're not going to have to like make up a fantasy. A lot of people, I think, speculate that that's what's happening with a lot of us is that we go ahead and we pay for it and then we get it and then we have to create some sort of imaginary level of quality in order to justify the purchase. No, I know. I understand that's why, you know, that's something that's a, that's a conclusion that you might come to while you're sitting there watching this through the rectangle of your phone or your TV. Right. I, I, I get how you came to that conclusion. Uh, wait till you handle it. And then you'll go, oh, I guess it, I guess it really is real. This, this knife did that to me faster, I think, than pretty much anything else that I've experienced. Right. Um, there's more or less fogginess surrounding that type of thing. Now, I'm not saying that every single knife that's more expensive than any other knife, that this is so obvious. I've handled knives that are a couple of grand that are really disappointing. feel like they should cost less than 1000 or even less than 500 right? But this knife, no. It specifically, it, it absolutely deserves to be where it is. I, I honestly think 850 bucks is a pretty good price. <laughs> They have a, they, they probably have a lot of different options. I've seen ones with various, uh, you know, anodized hardware, this or that. Um, but, uh, my goodness, I'm keeping this. This is mine. Um, this is absolutely, uh, one of, it'll, this will be one of my favorite knives in my collection. I own a lot of knives. I own a, close to 150 knives. Many of them are ultra premium. Um, I am so happy to, um, to uh, finally add this thing to my collection. I mean, I, I really am proud to own this. This is spectacular. Again, this is absolutely one of the best knives of 2023 and absolutely one of my favorite knives that I have ever reviewed on this channel. Um, this will go in, um, it's very, man, it's so rare. I can't remember the last time I put an $850 knife on my recommended knives playlist. But again, um, I don't expect people to like rush out and buy this. If you, if the last knife that you bought was an $80 Kershaw blur or a $65 Kershaw blur from Walmart, I'm obviously not saying you should definitely rush out and buy yourself a Hoghouse Veli. No. 
there's a lot of discovery, like self-discovery and learning what, what you want and what you're willing to pay for in between. But for people who have experienced the, the, the step before this one and you're wanting to go and go the next level, but you're afraid, you're like, I don't want to spend a bunch of extra money and just end up with something that's the same or an underwhelming, you know, it just doesn't have the quality that I'm looking for. Uh, you can confidently step up to this. If you can get your hands on a Hoghouse Valley, that, that'll, it'll feel like $850 well spent. So in that sense, it's going in my recommended knives playlist. And it's also going in my favorite knives of all time because it's so easy. I knew the moment I handled this and the first time I touched it, I was like, this is one of my favorite knives ever. So good. I'm a huge fan. I'll be paying close attention to Hoghouse knives in the future. And I should have been paying attention long before handling this. Thanks again to um, Tools for Gents for um, suggesting I take a look at this. Really, really happy about that one. Uh, please make sure to follow me on Instagram at metal underscore complex. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like. If you'd like to check out my other content, I do, of course, have lots of videos of knives that are either expensive or inexpensive that I do or don't like, so check those out. And if you enjoy all my content, go ahead and click on that Metal Complex logo right there and subscribe because there's definitely more coming. Thanks again for watching, everybody, and have a great day.